If Morsi had thrown his lot and from the beginning behind the revolutionary forces in his fight uh, against the old state, maybe the outcome could have been different. Hello, I'm David Hurst, editor of Middle East Eye, and with me is Hossam El Hamalawi, who is a journalist, an activist, and played a seminal role in the Egyptian revolution. Hossam, how did individual army generals react to Tahrir Square itself and, and those events? Can you describe in a bit more detail exactly what they tried to do? There is um, a common narrative uh, that had been spun by the military and especially Sisi uh, later that the army predicted uh, the revolution and that Sisi had written some report in 2010 that was secret and confidential uh, uh, to the field marshal Tantawi who was the minister of defense that you know Egyptians are going to erupt uh, because they are very upset about uh, the succession scheme and the Gamal Mubarak or Gamal Mubarak succeeding his dad and we have to be ready so when the revolution happened, they were ready and they, uh, they sided with the people. There is another narrative also that claims the army had been marginalized under Mubarak. Hence, they saw an opportunity when the revolution uh, happened. So they sided with the protesters. And these are the two main narratives. I mean, among, of course, hundreds, you know, I mean, of other claims and allegations. But I disagree completely with them. Uh, the army was surprised. Uh, by the move. It's not true that they they didn't really show any sign that they had been prepared for what they saw. This is the first thing. Secondly, when the army started deploying uh, uh, their troops, and this was after the collapse of the police force on the 28th of January 2011, which was dubbed the Friday of Rage, they were scared and they, the only reason that they did not open fire on the protesters was that they could not issue this order to their young officers and conscripts who were in the square uh, at the time because they could not uh, be assured of their loyalty and they expected that they might mutiny, uh, they go on mutiny if, if they were given uh, these orders. Uh, especially on the 10th of February, like one day before the army moved in to depose uh, Mubarak. Uh, this was at the height of the labor strikes that broke out in the last week uh, of the uprising. And the generals basically were in front of a very tough choice. Either they continue supporting Mubarak but then they would collapse with the whole regime since it wasn't just in Tahrir. I mean, Tahrir was taken to the factories. Tahrir was taken to all workplaces uh, at the time. Either they stand with Mubarak and the whole regime will blow up or they move to depose the head of the regime to try to stabilize the situation. What we also know that there was a, a split in the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces or SCAF uh, as we call it, between the older generals who were much more terrified and didn't know what to do and wanted like a quick end for the uprising, uh, and the younger generals represented by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who was then the head of the military intelligence, and Muhammad Farid Hijazi, who was one of the commanders of the field armies, they advocated a strong crackdown on the protesters. So this actually goes against the, the tale that he spun later about, you know, that he predicted the uprising and wanted to support it, you know, I mean, from uh, day one. So in, this is very telling about where the military really stood uh, during the 18 days and why they deposed Mubarak finally in the end. Mohamed Morsi, Egypt's first democratically elected president, uh, was in power but not in control. In retrospect, do you think his rule was doomed from the start? And will history be kinder to him than his contemporaries were? 
I don't think it was doomed from uh, the start. Um, in the beginning, um, no, the military and the old state was not necessarily uh, anti-Morsi and they were hoping to collaborate to bring the, re the revolution quickly uh, to an end. But as time went by, um, things did not go as, as planned. On the one hand, <clears throat> Morsi kept on giving you know, the military and the police one success, uh, more and more of what they wanted. Uh, more arms, um, protected the military business, um, whatever reservations the military had when it, when it came to drafting the constitution, for example, he, you know, I mean, completely agreed uh, to it. But at the same time, Morsi had a political base that he had to respond to. Um, and this is a little bit maybe different from like fascist leaders. I mean, people like to label the Muslim Brotherhood as fascist. I don't uh, do that. Um, this doesn't mean also that they are a progressive force, but they are not fascist. They, they have a multi-class uh, power base that they try all the time to satisfy or respond to which makes it impossible for them in the end to come up with one concrete uh, stand towards any uh, issue. Let me give you an example. Um, people used to make fun of Morsi because he would wake up in the morning and come up with neoliberal decrees. But then he would reverse them at night. And people used to make fun of him as, you know, a weak president who like, you know, says one thing but then does another thing, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't about him being weak. It was about him waking up in the morning to decree decrees that anyone in who's running the regime would do. But then he would get a backlash from his own power base, from his own political base, that would tell him this is negatively affecting us. So he, he was always vacillating and couldn't really take one solid position against this or against that. The other thing also to keep in mind, um, back to the, the question of the multi-class uh, uh, nature of, of the Islamist movement. Now, the Islamists on several occasions had mobilized uh, these like, you know, mass mobilizations calling for the implementation of Sharia, for example. And obviously, as a, as a secular person, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't support this, but I want us to look a little bit, you know, deeper into these slogans that they were talking about at the time. What is Sharia? You know, it, the answer that you would get from uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, organizer or member would differ according to his class. Maybe Sharia for Khairat Shatter, who is now in prison, and he was like, you know, the, the millionaire uh, in the leadership. Maybe it meant new liberal reforms. It meant flexible labor market. Meant um, getting rid of old rent uh, control uh, mechanisms. Maybe meant anti-union laws. Maybe meant what like any Tory, you know, I mean, would think of, of, <laughs> of when it comes to economic policies. But if you had approached a base cadre of, of the Muslim Brotherhood, of one of their like base activists, who would come from the urban poor or working class uh, background and ask him, what's Sharia for you? He would tell you Sharia is social security. Sharia is to have housing. Sharia is to have a decent job. Sharia is to have a decent education for my kids. Sharia is not getting thrown out in the streets, you know, without any social support. So, as you can see, like, Islamism in general with its very abstract slogans, in, in one way or another, they do allow for this vagueness. And it's intentional, because once they come up with a concrete position on anything, this would lead to the fracturing of the movement. During this one year, that Morsi stayed in office, we as socialist activists, you know, I mean, we had, of course, labor lawyers who present legal aid uh, to strikers. And some of 
the strikers who were sacked because of industrial actions and came to us to seek uh, legal support, they were Muslim Brotherhood members uh, at the time. So the organization was in turmoil. So back to your question, was he doomed? I mean, yes and no. On the one hand, that the old state was planning to give him a chance in the beginning, but he couldn't bring the streets to, uh, um, to a quick end when it comes to activism and protests. And actually, he came up with um, divisive uh, policies on so many occasions that kind of like polarized the country into secular and Islamist uh, camps. And by the spring of 2013, I mean, the country was more or less ungovernable uh, in the eyes of the military generals who were looking with concern about the protests that are erupting, the social protests, um, um, and all of these like tensions uh, with the Brotherhood. But on the other hand, if Morsi had thrown his lot and from the beginning behind the revolutionary forces in his fight uh, against the old state, maybe the outcome could have been different. <clears throat> but he was trying to have his cake and eat it too, like any good reformist actually, when you think about it. I mean, Morsi is not Salvador Allende, but at the same time, you can find parallels in terms of a reformist leader coming to, to office and trying to strike a balance between, you know, the old state and the revolutionary forces in the streets. There are no half, you know, solutions in, in revolutions. I mean, those who, you know, do or carry out half a revolution, they dig their own graves, you know, as the saying goes. Will history be kinder to him? I think, I mean, the way that he died <coughs> and the way that he stood fast against the coup um, definitely is something that one has to respect him uh, for, no matter what disagreements uh, one might have had uh, with him. He definitely did not deserve the way uh, that he died. And... Um, he, he basically um, was not, let's say, he, he was not fit for this job. Um, he was neither a clever tactician, uh, nor was he a, a, a wholehearted revolutionary, nor was he like an A to Z reactionary. So... In a way or another, um, it turned out into a, catastro a catastrophe in the end. And when you think about, I mean, who brought Sisi as a minister of defense? Um, who brought uh, Mohammed Ibrahim, you know, the minister of interior who oversaw the massacres, you know, later? These were all wrong choices uh, by Morsi and something that we have to blame him for. But um, I sympathize with his family, uh, including his sons who are in prison uh, at the moment not for any crime except being like Morsi's son. Um, I sympathize with his family and I wish them safety <clears throat> and I wish for his uh, release soon.